final tech walkthrough. Hello, my name is Michael Gaucher, and we have reached a good milestone in the creation of this program. We have the tabs, we have the headlines, and we have the content. One of the things we want to do with this content is put it in a form that is easier for us to read, to uh, see, and interact with. The data comes to us, this part of the data comes to us in HTML format. The, the overall data is in XML. But within the XML, there are what's called C data sections. And these C data sections encode data in other formats. And in this case, it's HTML format. Both XML and HTML are markup formats. Uh, HTML stands for hypertext markup language and XML stands for ex extensible markup language. Um, the key in both um, of those abbreviations uh, is um, markup. And what markup is, it's no different than when you're in Microsoft Word or Libri Writer, right? LibreOffice Writer. Um, you're writing a document, and then when you highlight some text and you um, choose the bold option, then the te that text is in bold. Uh, let's say you highlight another piece of text and you choose the I option, right? From the menu bar, you choose I, and that text is now... Um, it's in italics, so the text goes from this to slant. You know, it's slanted text. And you uh, click the U option, and now it's underlined. So what you see is bold, italic, underlined, right? But what actually happens is those words that you selected and that you press those uh, menu options on, behind the scenes, those words have tags around them. So the one that you uh, choose bold for, it has bold tags. And then the ones that you choose uh, underline and italic for, they have the, re the respective tags. Now, um, now, let's be more pedantic and say that Microsoft Word doesn't exactly use tags. It uses a derivation of RTF, rich text format. But it's the same concept that when you are in HTML and you want a word to be bold, um, you'll put angle brackets uh, B, right, around the around the word, or angle brackets uh, strong, right? You could use either one, B or strong, right? Or um, if you want it italicized, you can use um, angle brackets I or angle brackets EM. And then you can also use, um, you could just merely use uh, angle brackets um, span and then class, is equal to some CSS class, or you could use, um, you know, instead of class, you can use style equals, and then in quotes, um, put your text formatting uh, directives in the double quotes. And that's what we see with this article content, is that the information is in markup format, right? Which is great, because if we have the appropriate way to translate that markup, then we can make the document appear the way that the uh, creators of that article um, intended for that information, how that information to appear, right? So we can make the information appear the way that um, it needs to appear with the visual colors and bold and the, the highlighting, uh, the images and that sort of thing. So tags are great and they help us present the information, but when we're actually trying to read the information, they get in the way when we're trying to read it the way that humans read other documents, right? And so tags are for the computer to help the computer know how to translate the information in a way that we can read it more easily. So we need a way to use this HTML markup. We need an API because if you look at the other conversations I've had, we're using the API approach in this process, and we need an API that's going to assist us with that translation. And so I went through Help Viewer, and I went through the documents. I went through the uh, API documents for uh, WPF, and what I found was the web browser control. The web browser control is, and there's quite a bit of technical information behind that, right? Um, it uses the, the um, system's web browser, 
and that's how it accomplishes the translation. But basically, there's a function on this web browser control where we can feed in this content into this function, and then out the other side is information rendered on the screen in a readable format. It's absolutely fabulous. Uh, WebKit GTK has um, the web web view class, right? The WebKit uh, GTK web view class um, that does the exact same thing, right? It's the same concept. So. Um, having developed something similar in Linux, right? A similar RSS reader program in Linux, I kind of knew what to look for. And so that's what I went for. Um, I personally would have preferred a different method. I really would have preferred a different method, um, right? Uh, I don't like using uh, web browser controls, but in this particular process, it allowed us to streamline the process of getting the HTML encoded information into a readable format um, that we uh, normally associate with human reading. And so um, it's, it's a very convenient um, widget to have, user interface widget to have, and it's going to allow us to put the final touch on this example program written in Microsoft.net and C Sharp using the WPF framework and get us to where we want to be. The WPF framework has a web browser class that allows you to take HTML marked up content and present it on the screen in a nice readable way. And if you're connected to the internet, it will also render images that reside on a remote server. I went through the WPF documentation for the web browser class looking for the best way to plug in the HTML markup content that was coming from the RSS feed data stream that I had stored in the SQL Server database. After reviewing this document for a couple of minutes, I saw navigate to string looks very promising. Based on the documentation, I feed in a HTML fragment or a full HTML document markup and the web browser control as a visual element part of a window will show that HTML markup in the proper way. So. I already have a variable declared for article text for the article content. And all I have to do now is modify it so that it uses an instance of the web browser class, or it instantiates an instance of the web browser class. On line 120, 120, I changed the assignment to the article content to use the function navigate to string. So I build the program and then run the program to see if this small change is all I needed. Unfortunately, I received an error. And the error is of type argument null exception. So apparently, one or more parts of the argument is null. Now, since C Sharp uses short circuit evaluation when evaluating an argument or a part of a evaluation structure, then you can, you can actually read the argument from left to right as a quick way to troubleshoot in your mind. And so in this case, I'm going to start with article. Either something's wrong with article or something's wrong with the object or reference that article refers. So I broke it up a little bit. I broke up the parameter that I'm passing. I broke it up a little bit into its own variable and then I'm going to pass in the variable to facilitate troubleshooting. 
So when the article text variable that is now on line 119 evaluates, it evaluates to an empty string. So an empty string is not a null object. It's not a null object reference. So the argument that's passed is valid. So the code I've written is valid in terms of what the error message is showing on the surface. So it must be some other issue that is internal to the navigate to string function. I've worked with objects like this dozens of times and so I had a good idea or intuition as to what it could be. So I'm going to set the breakpoint to line 121 so that way I can modify the variable on line 119. I'm going to do that while Visual Studio is running. I'm going to change the variable value on line 119 and I'm going to do that well at this time I thought I was going to do that in the command window actually I need to be in the immediate window but let's go along with my slip up for this moment and see what that looks like you'll notice in the lower right hand part of the Visual Studio screen the part that has a blue bar I am writing essentially code in line okay and then I realize that's the wrong tab to be in so I, I, I'm going to tab over to the immediate window so I'm going to take article text is equal to and so I'm forming an HTML fragment I am actually writing an entire HTML document the mo one of the most basic HTML documents you can write so I put that in the immediate window and I press enter and that executes the code as if that code was written in the actual code file itself and so I've essentially changed our, if you look in the lower left hand corner the part that's highlighted red you'll see that article text is now changed so now that I've changed that I can run that line of code and then I run it down to line 124 notice no error everything's fine so what that means is navigate to string expects a full HTML document that's properly formatted even if that HTML document shows nothing so I'm going to take that insight and I'm going to encode that into a class level constant so this will be the default value for navigate to string so if I don't have article content which Consequently, it could also be the case if you select a headline and then you hold down the control key and you click that headline you just selected, so it's unselected, therefore no headlines are selected. That's the same thing as setting the string to empty or setting the content to the default HTML document. So I'm looking for a good place to put this class level constant it's going to be a constant string and it's going to be the empty article content so I'm going to use the string that I successfully tested with in the immediate window and then I'm going to reference that in the null coalesce operator statement that I have on what was line 119 it's gotten pushed down a little bit since I added a variable at the class level so that is now line 121 and so I set it to empty article and I should be able to run the program without any issues whatsoever so control shift B to build to see if there's any syntax errors there are none let's press the start button and the program launches so I'm able to successfully click through the headlines and see the corresponding article content the detailed article content on the right hand side and it is no longer in blatant HTML 
format HTML markup. But the window is just too small. The window is just too small. That is a function of using the stack panel as the root content, the root visual element that contains the other elements. Previously, we used a grid container for the headline that's shown on the right hand side and the article content. So that part actually worked very well, but, and that went vertically, but to go from left to right and do that with greater sizing control, a grid container is a better way to go about that. And so I'm going to take the stack panel that's declared in the XAML and change that to a grid. And once I do that, I will have to make other modifications so that the grid is now usable, the grid type that the root content declared in the XAML is usable in the code. So you'll notice on lines 70 through 80, I am making various calls to children.add. That function is that it, that function call sequence is interchangeable between grid and stack panel. They're both of type panel, and so they implement that interface, and they contain children visual elements, child visual elements. And so that part does not need to change. What needs to change is to designate which area of the screen or which part of the grid the visual elements will occupy. And at the same time, set up a sizing strategy, a sizing configuration for the columns that will allow the appropriate amount of width and height to be assigned to the sections of the grid that these visual elements will occupy. And so I set in a for loop that is going to establish the rows, the rows for the grid, right? So we're setting up the rows for the grid and this is going to improve the way that the headline and the article content is laid out vertically. And although I showed this particular process in a brief way in a previous video, this is a fuller explanation. So for each item that we have going vertically, we're going to have a row definition object. This row definition object will establish a space that one or more visual elements can occupy. I typically do only one visual element per row definition. And so you'll see on the right hand side of the screen, we got a better uh, expression of the headline and the article content as we click through headlines. So vertically, on the right hand side, vertically, we are in great shape. We are in tremendous shape. Everything is shaping up very well. But what we want to do next is shape that left to right sequence. So on line 14 in the XAML, in the XAML file that accompanies the C sharp code behind file, I change the type to grid and I remove the orientation equals vertical, horizontal. And I remove that because orientation is not a relevant concept for the grid. The grid is more granular and gives you more control over the layout than the stack panel does. 
And so I am clarifying the various sections of the grid and I'm adding in the definition that goes from left to right. So these are column definitions. Notice that you don't have to say that a given row or a given column is a certain height for all rows and all columns. You can use logic like I do here where I can vary the width and height depending on which row or column I am on or other conditions. And that's the power of doing this through the WPF API rather than in XAML. And you can see that we have a full screen full of content and everything is laying out the way that it did in the Linux version of the program. Remember from the earlier video, particularly the UI requirements video, where we had our snapshot. So we've reached a great milestone and let's celebrate this milestone with a git commit. Let's save our changes so that we have everything ready to go. And now that that program is built, I have connected to Wi-Fi and I want to run this program outside of Visual Studio. So to do so, I go to the actual folder on the C drive in Windows 11 where this program actually resides as we were building it. So you see six files there. Well, three of those files are older files from when in an earlier video you saw that we had named the project the wrong name. And so there was a misspelling. So when I renamed the Visual Studio project, the name of the Visual Studio project helps generate the actual name of the executable. So we got rid of the old executables and let's just use the most current one that we've been building through Visual Studio. So this is the actual program file and we're going to run it directly by clicking open. This program then is going to use the web browser control and it's using the Wi-Fi connection, the network connection, and it's able to pull the images in. It's able to pull in the for relevant, relevant formatting. It does a number of things for us automatically. So as we click through the tab, we have our content filled out properly and everything looks absolutely amazing. What you may have noticed is that when we launched this program, it launched much faster when we launched it directly than when we launch it through Visual Studio. And Visual Studio on a Pentium processor does not run the programs quite as quickly, but it allows us to get the job done nonetheless. And so I want to see how it sizes. It sizes great. And I want to launch that one more time. Let's see that performance. So let's launch that one more time. Let's double click this time. And you see, it comes up instantly. We're able to click on everything and it's all good. Thank you for tuning in for this process and all the lessons learned. We will explore the overview of how this all went in the final video, video 15, where we talk about creating an RSS reader in C Sharp and .NET on a computer with an Intel Pentium processor and four gigabytes of RAM. Stay tuned for the conclusion.